One of the most well-known photos of Xu Zhimo, Ali's great-grandpa, is one taken with Tagore when he visited China. The world-famous Bengali poet was then accompanied throughout his trip by Xu Zhimo and Lin Huiyin, a noted 20th-century female Chinese architect and writer. These are two titles very few women from her time could dream of. Lin and her husband, Liang Sicheng, made unprecedented efforts documenting China's phenomenal architectural heritage, and they were painstakingly also devoted to the restoration work despite tremendous challenges and pressures. That part of history, Annie Liang, the great-granddaughter, understands all too well. Though she grew up in the U.S., she has certainly the family passion for architecture. To her, it is a romance of generations and a source of strength. Every time I'm here, you know, I just feel like I've gone through, you know, gone back into time. Um, every time I'm here, you know, I just think about the legacy, the work that my great-grandparents have done here. They've been making so much effort in order to protect China's ancient architectures. Here in Beijing, behind us, the Forbidden City, but certainly a lot of ancient gates and roads, pagodas that were dear to their hearts. You went to some of those, don't you? Yes. Fu Guang Si, also translated as the Temple of Buddha's Light. Yes. I know you frequented there. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. This is a very special uh, temple or um, an ancient architecture that my great-grandparents had discovered uh, in 1937. So last year actually marked the 80th anniversary of the discovery of this great temple, which was largely hidden um, because it was um, kind of away from the tourist paths and really well preserved. And so before then, um, there were a lot of uh, Western and Japanese scholars who had traveled to China, um, visited many historical sites, but had not found uh, architecture that predated the um, Liao or the Jin dynasties. And uh, Fu Guangzi was the first temple that, uh, that my great-grandparents had discovered uh, that dated back to the Tang dynasty. It's a very unique architectural style. Mm -hmm. Yes. Low key and yet extremely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful with grand um, roofs. And uh, I think that at the time it was very significant because Japanese scholars had claimed that only Japan had preserved um, uh, temples and pagodas dating back to the Tang Dynasty era. And uh, since the discovery of this temple, um, we were able to um, also claim that China had also preserved um, a wonderful feat of architecture from the Tang Dynasty. Your great-grandma actually was designing the emblem of China. You could see that in the Tiananmen Square, not far from here. Yes, that's right. Um, but at the same time, when they are trying to preserve the ancient architectures, they were not necessarily always successful efforts. Some failed. Mm -hmm. I wonder how they reflected about that through their interactions with family members. I feel that while a lot of the hutongs in this region that we're seeing um, have been lost or not preserved, um, but a lot of the you know, more historically significant monuments have been preserved. So I think that's really positive. I mean, even behind us, we see this you know, beautiful remnants of the Forbidden City. Um, you know, dating back to almost, you know, the Yuan Dynasty in, in China. And so I think it's, it's really special being back here in Beijing to be able to see and, and witness the changes, but at the same time, now, you know, the common people are able to, um, to visit these historical sites, which were historically, you know, reserved for, you know, the, the emperors and the, um, the royal family. Madam Ling Huiyin, she is being considered, uh, you know, through decades as one of the biggest beauties of modern China. Of course, people describe her as beauty as in a way to respect her because of her intellectual achievements. But I guess, you know, as a woman growing up in a family, there might be a lot of pressure that others would compare you, Annie, to your great-grandma. Well, thankfully, you know, having grown up in the U.S., you know, it was felt less because, you know, I grew up 
you know, more with Western influences. Mm -hmm. But having moved back to China, um, I, I feel that, you know, she's really someone that I look up to. Yeah. You know, her influence, the, her uh, accomplishments, and then her perseverance, as you alluded to earlier. I think that's really all, you know, very strong character traits that every woman should aspire yeah, to. I'm sure when someone introduces, oh, this is the great-granddaughter, Oh, Lin Huiyin, everybody wants to come up and have a photo with you, shake hands with you. Well, yeah, <laughs> sometimes. I, I think the expectations are there, yeah. but expectations for me... Expectations for what? I think um, to achieve some sort of greatness and, and to really, you know, have that type of influence that she had. But I think that, you know, she lived in a different historical period. Absolutely. Very unique um, situation and cir circumstances. But for our generation, I think that, you know, given that we're living in the modern world, we really have to take advantage of all the great opportunities out there with modern technologies and, and sort of, you know, the challenges that we're facing. The point about them is not only because they studied overseas, mm -hmm. but what they studied, they immediately brought it back home. Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure they practice them in order to help the people here. Um, many of them, uh, you know, my great-grandparents' peers, uh, were economists and philosophers scientists. and scientists and then they all came back to China because they knew that it was important to, um, you know, it, it was also a, a sense of nationalism and love for their country and then also they brought back what they had learned to really, you know, build the current, you know, scientific system, you know, to build, you know, architectural history, uh, you know, philosophy in China. Right. If you think about their generation, you know, it was a generation during this great transformation in China. But when you think about now, China, of course, is in a very different place. But I just wondered how did they, their generation, have the courage to be able to be this bridge in a way, be able to make that huge transformation and every one of them shine during that process? You know, I often um, think back to those times. I think that, you know, um, our peers and our friends often uh, are nostalgic for that period of the 1920s and 30s when you had this uh, artistic and literary flourishing in China um, and that was uh, mostly contributed by these uh, wonderful scholars who had studied um, in the West, um, in, in Europe and in the U.S. So I have to say that my family was extremely fortunate to have been given the opportunity to study uh, first in the U.S. and then having spent some time in, the, uh, in Europe as well. You don't choose your family. You don't choose your time period. But they could be real assets, as you can be to them. Two different generations, two critical junctures, two family stories intertwined, a legacy remembered and thriving.